happy Monday. My name is Sharika Himes, and I am the founder and host of the Total Woman Summit. Welcome to today's edition of the Total Woman Summit pre-virtual workshop series. Today, we are going to be talking with Sandy Brumley, who is the Director of County Crime Victims and Rape Crisis Center, and we're going to be talking about the impacts that COVID-19 has had on domestic violence and those numbers and statistics and what we can do as a community and society to help her and her team uh, sort of drive down these numbers and raise our own awareness. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you all Sandy Brumley. Hi, Sandy. How are you? Hey, Sharika, thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. We are so excited to have you. We are so excited to have you, not necessarily for the reasons that we have to invite you on, but I'm always happy to give a voice to the important work that you do. So before we get started, I'd like for our audience to let us know if they can see and hear us okay. They're going to tell us in chat if they can see and hear us okay. You say testing, testing. Testing, testing. Okay, perfect. And someone will drop us a note in chat. All right, sounds like they can hear us okay. Thank you all so much. So as I mentioned, my name is Sharika Hines. I'm the founder and host of the Total Woman Summit. We are in our second week of our 11 days, 26 speakers, 22 sessions, where we are helping you flourish as a total woman in every area of your life. Last week, we hosted more than 600 women to all of our workshops, and we had such rich meaningful conversation, and we've already had the calls and the emails and the texts and DMs pouring in about how women are applying that information to change their lives. And this week is going to be no less uh, successful and amazing, and I'm so happy to have my good friend Sandy here to kick it off with us today. Before we get started, I'd like to just lay down a few house rules. And for those of you that are new to the Total Woman Summit experience, the Total Woman Summit was created to educate women, to empower women, I'm sorry, through education, connection, and the community. And in keeping with our commitment to education and community, we are educating and empowering you about the topics and conversations that matter to you the most, even those that are less desirable um, and that are not so visible in the community, like the one we're discussing today, which is domestic violence. And also, in connection with our commitment to community, the work that those that are on the front lines that are doing this work to help those victims and those survivors of domestic violence and, quite frankly, those perpetrators of domestic violence find a new way, a new normal, and a new life uh, to express themselves. And so we're super excited to get into this conversation so we can be a part of the solution that Sandy and her team do. Um, what we are going to do today, rules 1 through 50, is we are going to have fun. Rules 51 through 100, this is a conversation. Sandy and I are talking to each other, and you're talking to us. You don't have to wait until the end of the conversation to ask your questions. You can start pouring them into our Q&A right now. You can do that anonymously, or you can be really bold, and you can put your name in chat and ask your question. Doesn't matter to us in either way. We're going to answer them live, and we're going to get the information that you need. I have my dear friend and help uh, right hand, Shamel, who is going to be capturing all of the good notes and nuggets that Sandy gives to us in the chat. So make sure you stay tuned, make sure you pay attention, and let's get engaged. So Sandy, tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Sure. Well, again, thank you so much for having, for having me on today and talking about this important topic. Um, I have been doing this work for 20 years this year. Um, it's a funny story. I actually went to law school to become Jerry Maguire. I wanted to be a sports agent. Um, and I, then I decided that I couldn't stand law school and I didn't know what I wanted to do at all. And so I ended up working for a local housing authority. And when I was there, I came across some clients who came in um, and they said, hey, I was a victim of domestic violence last night. I was beat up by my partner. Uh, and now I'm being kicked out of this public housing unit. Why am I and my kids being kicked out of this public housing unit when I'm the victim of domestic violence? Um, and I said, well, you know, that's BS. I don't know why that's the way that is. Um, and so I then had a reason to stay in law school. I had a reason to stay 
and fight for those who didn't always have folks to fight for them. Um, the law around public housing has since been changed due to the Violence Against Women Act, and so it's, victims are no longer kicked out. That's, uh, that's not an issue any longer, but victims still face lots and lots of issues every single day in our community around this country. Um, and so it's been my um, honor and my privilege to do this work for 20 years to make sure that victims do have a voice in our community. Um, on a personal level, Shrika, you know this about me. I grew up in, in a home that um, domestic violence was present in. And uh, unfortunately that domestic violence went back three different generations. Uh, and that's oh pretty God. common in families. And uh, one of the things that my, my brother, uh, my only other sibling, my brother and I promised ourselves when we were teenagers is we were gonna do, make every effort not to continue that cycle of violence in our family. Um, and we're both still working hard at that today. And so it's not only a professional passion of mine, but it's a personal passion of mine to get the word out about domestic violence, about other forms of violence in our community, and the fact that we can break generational cycles of both family violence and community violence. Wow, Sandy. First off, I'm so grateful that um, you are so willing to share your personal pieces of your own story to this conversation. And so thank you for that. And I'm so happy to hear that you and your brother have a commitment to stopping the violence in your family and that you guys are being successful at doing that. So that's the win. And hopefully that gives hope to those of you that have experienced that or maybe going through it or see other people that change is possible with some intentionality um, on making sure that that is not your normal or your reality. And so Sandy, one of the things that um, was really shocking to me as uh, we started talking about uh, shelter at home and safer at home was the reality, uh, was the frequency and the types of messages that your team was putting out on social media. Because I follow uh, Sandy's office and I also support them. Um, they're good friends of mine. And I was just really shocked to hear why the rest of us were worried about tissue and food and talking about some of our rights of being able to assemble together, being taken away, you you were servicing a different group of people that were concerned that actually they weren't safer at home. Can you talk to us a little bit about how this virus has impacted those who um, are in those violent situations? Sure. I think, uh, so the reason why we've become so prolific on social media um, and by the way, the Crime Victims and Rape Crisis Center handle is at respect to connect and it's respect the, the number two and then connect. Um, so please follow us for more tips and, and guidance to help out your neighbors and your friends. Um, but the reason why we've been so uh, vocal on social media is because frankly, we're not getting the calls we would like to get. Um, we know that there are so many folks out there who are not safer at home. In fact, uh, these safer at home orders have actually increased their likelihood of violence, but also increases their light, their, the severity of that violence. So um, what might have been a punch in the past might now involve weapons. Um, so that type of severity is also increasing. And so that's what we're concerned about is that frankly, um, our police, our colleagues at the police department are saying that their numbers are not going up. Um, I know our calls for sexual assault forensic exams, what's commonly known as rape kits, um, they're not going up. They've actually gone down a little bit. And so what we're most concerned about is that there are victims out there who are not, who feel like they're not able to access services during this time. And so we really want to let folks know that there are services that they've continued the entire time we've all been under these stay at home orders. Hmm. So, wow. So one of the things that I had to really uh, sort of digest and unpack when you said that was, so let me put myself in that, in that position. So why might these numbers be escalating? Is that because now um, an abuser doesn't have to worry about not hitting you in the face or not using um, a certain degree of violence because you don't have to report to work tomorrow because you'll be at home and there's no one that'll need to see you. Um, or they're not getting able to, being able to get outside the home to blow off steam or use other distractions that may exhaust them from being violent or that may uh, sort of get in the way of them being violent. You are essentially stuck at home 
every day, and now you become the focus of um, their attention in ways that other distractions might have prevented in the past. Is that does that sound about right? That's absolutely correct. So isolation is one of the common tenets of domestic violence, right? Offenders use isolation as a tactic to keep victims from seeking services, to keep victims from hanging out with their friends and family, anything to sort of um, continue that control, that power and control over the victim uh, is what offenders do anyway. So this just actually helps that situation because we're, we're all a little bit more isolated now than we ever have been. Um, so the isolation happens, but then you're right, there's no um, evidence cover up having to happen right now either. So bruises or um, even bigger wounds and bruises, whatever, we don't really have to worry about those. Uh, we also have um, victims who are just in different situations. So, you know, victims uh, of violence are their own best advocates. They know their safety better than anybody else. We say that to every victim who walks in the door that they know their situation best. And they have lived uh, within their schedules and figured out the safest way to live throughout their schedules uh, under normal circumstances. And then we're thrown into these sort of chaotic times where now they're isolated and now they. They just don't know what to do uh, in order to keep themselves safe. And so they've had to recreate safety plans, recreate what, what's going to work for them and their kids during this situation. Wow. So you mentioned that the uh, calls to the police and the calls to your office, not only uh, do you help uh, domestic violence um, victims, but you also aid in helping those victims of sexual assault. Uh, crimes. And so those numbers are actually going up because um, they may be forced in these scenarios to have non-consensual sex right now, um, perform uh, non-consensual sexual acts. And so then that evidence over time is also deteriorating, right? Because the longer that they're at home, that evidence is going away, whatever bruises, internal scars or whatever that you all would typically collect. How are you all prepared to address, I mean, what would a victim do after weeks of isolation and this has been happening repeatedly, um, but as the world is opening up, they are being held against their will sort of to allow that evidence to deteriorate. What, what would a victim do in this situation? Sure. So uh, people forget that sexual violence is a very common form of domestic violence. So uh, sexual assault occurs in at least half of all domestic violence relationships. Um, and we don't think about that because sometimes people think, you know, sex is part of marriage, that kind of thing, but it's not true. I mean, any kind of unconsensual sex is rape. Um, and so uh, for victims to come forward for services, one, we've been open this whole time. So any victim of sexual violence can come for services today. Uh, we typically say evidence collection happens within about 96 hours, but we also are, we want to talk to you about the situation. We might be able to at least get you in here, um, do a medical exam, get STI testing, anything else that you're concerned about, we still want to be able to see you. So we're here, we're available. I've got sexual assault nurse examiners available 24-7, 365 here. Okay, so not business hours. You don't have to wait to until business hours. If you can only get out while someone is asleep or while they're on some awkward overnight shift, your office can collect this um, evidence and help them during non-business hours. And that's for those of us, too, that may know someone who's in this type of situation. Is that correct? That is correct. And so I'll give you um, our 24-hour uh, sexual assault hotline. It's 901-222-4350. Uh, okay. So 901-222-4350. And again, that's 24-7-365. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And that is for those of you who are joining us that are local to um, the Memphis area, uh, to the Shelby County area. However, if you are joining us from uh, some other city and state, then you can certainly find that information. Where would one typically uh, find that type of information, Sandy? 
Sure. So there is a national domestic violence hotline and a national sexual assault hotline. Um, I wish I had both numbers up in front of me. I will find those before we get off today. But there, if you okay. just Google national domestic violence hotline or national sexual assault hotline, it should be the first one of the first two things that comes up. Okay, very well. So we want to make sure that we make sure that we have these three notes. Number one, 96 hours for evidence collection for sexual assault. There's a window for them to be able to collect this evidence for 96 hours. So if you have to wait, everybody goes to sleep. You have to leave home sometimes. If you can get there, how long does this typically take when they come to your office? If they have a short window of opportunity, how long does that normally take, Sandy? to get this um, evidence to go through that process? To undergo the exam. So our exams yes. can go anywhere from 30 minutes if you just want STI testing, just want to talk to an advocate, that kind of thing, to several hours, depending on how much injury there is and how much documentation needs to take place by our nurses. Um, they're gonna, if, if you call and talk to a nurse ahead of time, they can give you an estimate, but really we're gonna try to work with you and do whatever is safe for you. So if we know you have a time window we can work with you on that time window. You can come back the next day for the next, you know, whatever small time window you have the next day. Whatever is safe for you is what we're going to do. Okay, perfect. And then, um, just to be clear, if they don't have their own transportation, do we also provide or make provisions for that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So during business, actually really at this point, 24-7, uh, we utilize Memphis Police Department to get victims here to the office. So okay. I know that may, be, that may sound like an additional barrier because sometimes people are anxious about calling the police. Um, but we can try to send an unmarked car and we can try to do the best we can to get you here as safely as possible. Once you get to the Rape Crisis Center, the Crime Victims of Rape Crisis Center, you have the decision whether or not you want to move forward with reporting to law enforcement and going forward with the investigation. It's, it's ultimately the victim's decision. So even okay. if MPD is called to bring you to the center, you still, have, you still have plenty of time to figure out for yourself whether or not you want to move forward with that investigation. Okay, good deal. And you have a decision. We want to just reiterate that you don't have to prosecute if you just want or you don't have to press charges. You can decide if you want to do that after exam. If your primary concern or if you're just at a place where you just want to get the STI testing or you want to just examine the extent of your damages, then you can do that. The decision is up to you. No one is forcing you to do anything. And there is no cost for this, correct, Sandy? That's correct. All of our services are free of charge and everything is 100% confidential. Okay, that's good to know. And what about if they are found that have an ST, um, STD or some, some other um, sexual transmitted disease as a result of this violence? What would that treatment look like? Is that also at no cost? Yep, so we, we coordinate closely with the health department and with uh, an organization called The Corner. It's, uh, it's run by Friends for Life. And The Corner provides free follow-up, uh, again, future STI testing, but also something called PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, um, to prevent people from acquiring HIV. And so we work with The Corner on that, and then we work with the health department on any future STI um, treatment that may be needed or anything like that. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. It's all, it's all free. All free. And that's free across the board. If you even don't live locally and you call across the board, right, to these national hotline services, all of these services for victims are free. And the correct. decision is yours. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So let's talk about those of us that um, may know someone that are in these situations, um, but not are impacted ourselves. So. I remember talking to you and in doing this work closely in the community, hearing it could take a woman up to, or a victim seven to nine times before they actually decide to leave. And so as that time progresses, one of the concerns is sort of the declining compassion or empathy for someone in that scenario. Can you first talk a little bit about why it may take someone seven to nine times over a period of time before they actually decide to leave their abuser? Yeah. So uh, victims sometimes engage in what we call counterintuitive behavior. Things that just don't seem to make sense to me make perfect sense to that victim because of lots of reasons. One, 
the impact of trauma on their brain. So trauma can actually impact our brain. It can impact the way that we process memory. It can impact the way we tell stories in the future. It can impact our relational uh, capabilities with other people. So keeping up relationships with our friends and family members. Uh, so that's one explanation for some counterintuitive behavior like staying with an offender. Um, another reason is something called the cycle of violence. And that is that these offenders are not always violent. Sometimes these offenders are loving people, they're loving partners, sometimes they're loving parents. Um, and so oftentimes it's in a cycle that can, can be tension building and then violence, but then it goes back to what we used to call a honeymoon phase. Um, and just sort of, you know, the bottom line is that's still your partner from, from it's the person you fell in love with at one point, right? And so when you're in that cycle, it's a little bit uh, crazy making for victims. It can be a little bit difficult to figure out what you want to do because sometimes life is good right and so the cycle is another issue and then the third issue is just a cost benefit analysis of what do i want to do what do, what what is this decision how how will it impact my life for example he pays half the rent or half the mortgage. Maybe he pays all the rent or the mortgage. Maybe um, if I leave, I won't have childcare because he or she watches the kids during the day. Maybe I just won't have any money to actually feed these kids anymore. So there's lots of reasons and just a cost benefit analysis why we stay with people who maybe aren't necessarily good for us. Um, and the other thing I really wanna point out is that sometimes leaving is not the only option. Sometimes it is possible to change the dy dynamics of your relationship, particularly when it's sort of low level violence um, or when it's more about that coercive control and um, particularly when that offender has themselves experienced trauma. Um, I truly believe that people can can build resiliency after trauma. I truly believe that we can change our behavior. The reason why I know that is true is because my dad, who was abusive growing up, um, is now one of my very best friends and is a really, really good grandfather to his grandkids um, and a really good partner to my mom now uh, in a way he wasn't for the first 20 years of their marriage. And so I know it's possible to change. Now, the difficulty mm -hmm. is for each victim, it's gonna look different and it's it's going to be talking through all of their risk factors whether or not their safety is in jeopardy whether or not there's some lethality factors in place and we can talk more about the lethality issues in a minute um, but really it's going to be for that victim to decide so that's a long answer back to your original question which is what do we do in the meantime when they're going through this decision process right it's up and down we get frustrated we say dude i'm tired of talking about this i told you to leave them la 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 right and um, at the end of the day we just need to be continually supportive of these survivors letting them know we're going to be here for you no matter what it is your decision it's your relationship i'm really concerned for your safety and i want to still be here no matter what happens that's good. And you mentioned two terms that I would like to get a little bit more clarity around. First, one, the first one is low level violence. Can you explain to us what you mean by that? Sure. So a lot of offenders actually uh, don't use gratuitous violence, meaning they don't use um, strong violence. Most offenders use only what is necessary to keep that victim quote in check. Mm. Um, and so uh, it could be really just one violent incident early on, and not really on the relationship, but sort of a little bit into the relationship once you've gotten to know each other. It could be one violent incident and everything since that first violent incident hasn't actually been physical violence, but it's been reminders of that violence or threats around that prior violence. Um, and so it's not an ongoing pattern of physical violence. It's really an ongoing pattern of the power of control that we're worried about. And so we want folks to, um, we want folks to get help. We want folks who are exhibiting that level of power and control over their partners to realize that that power, that power and control is really about their own issues, their own stuff that they haven't resolved yet. And so if we can get these offenders into um, about what's called a better intervention program, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. people use the word anger management informally, um, but really mm -hmm. it's about programs who teach people about healthy relationships. And that mm -hmm. it's really not, 
not healthy to want to control your party. And, and that's, a, that's something that unfortunately is a learned behavior, but I think it also can be unlearned. Is that during this time, is that, are they separated while they go through this? Because clearly my question would be, right, as an onlooker would be, um, so you go to one session and then that clearly, that doesn't even work with therapy, solve your issue. More often than not, is there a period of separation um, until this person finishes the program or has gotten deep enough into the program where they recognize that they have other tools and resources um, or they have changed this learned behavior, or are they going through, typically going through this program and still living with um, their victim? I think in a perfect world, we would like to see people separate um, and be able to rebuild their lives separately and then decide if they can get back together uh, because there is so much work that needs to be done. The resiliency that needs to happen for the victim to overcome their trauma, but then also the offender to overcome their, most of them also have prior trauma histories, but then also to figure out their, just their choices, their behavior and how that's impacted other people in their lives. So in a perfect world, it'd be great for them to be separate. Um, in the real world, we pay rent and mortgage. And so sometimes that's not always possible. Um, but we certainly recommend that folks try, if possible, to separate during that time and to really focus on getting themselves together before they focus on getting that relationship back together. Got it. Thank you. And then the other term you used was coercive control. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So a lot of times with power and control situations, um, uh, people use coercion as a means to convince people or to um, really force people into situations they're not, they don't want to do. So for example, uh, what I talked about earlier regarding uh, sexual, so intimate partner sexual assault, sexual assault that happens within a relationship, that's often through coercive control. It's often through, this is what you, you know, things like uh, emotional abuse, uh, this is what you owe me, um, you're married to me, the Bible says we have to do these things, whatever. So using, using some form of coercion, something that is important to the victim. So for example, in that case, her religion, but using it against them to get their way. And so um, wow. coercion, yeah, coercion could be lots of different things. Uh, it could be the use of alcohol and drugs, but it also could be a lot of times just that emotional abuse that's getting the victim sort of right where the, right where the offender knows it's gonna hurt most. Okay. Thank you for that, for that understanding. And don't forget, you guys, if you have questions, I'm trying to answer them as they come in, but if you have questions, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A. Don't wait until the end, or you can put them in chat if you are feeling particularly bold, whichever way. doesn't matter. We want to get to them. What advice would you give to those folks, um, Sandy, who have been going through this cycle of abuse uh, with a close relative or a close friend? Um, and they are getting frustrated themselves and don't know really how to continue to love the person um, and be in their life, but also watch them be um, harmed in this way. What, what advice would you give those folks? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the first thing I would say to anybody is take care of yourself first because you need to be healthy if you want to ultimately be able to help anybody else. Um, so self-care is super important. Um, and then secondly, it's, it's trying to uh, muster up as much, as much patience as you possibly can. Uh, it is not easy. It's not easy even as a victim service provider uh, where we have clients who we know are going back with offenders. Um, it's not easy, even though we know this is part of the cycle. We know it's the, it's the shtick. It's, it's, what, it's what happens. It's still really difficult to wrap our heads around sometimes. And it can be really frustrating. So go ahead and vent that frustration out to anybody else but the survivor <laughs> um, and try your best to, um, to keep the, just the basic statements to the survivor. I'm here for you. I'm concerned for your safety. I want more for you and your kids, but I'm here to support you no matter what you choose. Okay. Um, and so that's really good advice, right? Take care of yourself first. And it is per perfectly okay for you to go to therapy, for you to help continue to support someone else. So that's really important. And Sandy, can you put a little bit of meat around um, the fact that I've heard that you can't rescue someone who's not ready to go? 
that you can't go and snatch them out of the situation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, I actually had this incident in my own family. Um, there was a time, I don't know, I was maybe 15 years old, and we quote unquote rescued my aunt from a violent relationship. Um, you know, sort of swooped in, packed up her stuff and her two kids and, and moved her uh, up to my grandparents' house. And within two weeks, the offender had also moved to the same town of where my grandparents lived and my aunt, you know, moved back with them. Um, and, and it's because at the end of the day, it's their relationship, it's their choice, right? And so no matter what we set them up with, no matter how nice the new house is, no matter what, um, if we're gonna pay rent for a few months or whatever it is, they're still in a relationship with somebody that they love, even if that's some, that same person also hurts them. Um, mm -hmm. And so really it's just a matter of continuing to, to, to not assume that we know what's best for the victim, to remind ourselves that they do know what's best for them, um, even if it seems completely counterintuitive to what we would choose, that at the end of the day, we have to just keep supporting them, even if they are engaging in what we consider bad behaviors or bad decisions. Wow. Wow. So listen, as much as you love them, you cannot save them if they are not ready to make a decision about their relationship. The only thing you will do is escalate that situation and possibly put yourself in harm's way or others in harm's way. Um, and also, so I will, you can also further isolate that victim because uh, once you do that, one, the offender is going to say, I don't want that person anywhere near you again, right? So the offender maybe mm -hmm. not won't let you hang out with the victim again, but also if, even from the victim standpoint, now they're embarrassed or ashamed and now they're, they're not going to be willing to talk to you the next time. And so um, we really don't want to do anything that will further isolate that victim, put them in further jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Don't further isolate the victim. Don't put them in further jeopardy. And you mentioned something also um, while you were talking. You said something about um, tell your frustrations to anyone except the victim about them not leaving. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I mean, it's easy to just say, girl, you are making the dumbest decision, you know, even, you know, especially your best friend, somebody you talk to like that, you know, God, this just sounds like the stupidest decision ever, um, really will go, uh, will probably not go over well with that survivor because they know what they're doing or not doing well. And, um, and like I said, you can still say you're concerned for somebody. Um, you can still say you want more for them and for their children, but, uh, but not in a way that further alienates them or isolates them. And as far as venting to other people, um, I might, I maybe should be a little bit more um, careful. So it's really important also not to vent to people who maybe would increase uh, that victim's risk. So we certainly don't want, for example, to vent to her father if her father's going to show up and confront the offender or other sorts of things that might further uh, increase the risk of violence in that relationship. And so when I say vent, I mean vent to other people who are safe to vent to outside of this situation. Okay. Okay. Wow. Wow. So much good information here. Now, I would like to just because sometimes we have an idea of what a victim, I mean, of what a perpetrator and what an abuser looks like, and it's always a man. But can you help us better understand that it's not always the man that's the abuser? Can you talk a little bit about that, Sandy? Absolutely. So um, I think national statistics still bear out that about 85% of all offenders are men. So when we, tip, we typically think about domestic violence, we think about a male offender and a female victim in a heterosexual relationship. Um, and that is still true. The statistics bear that out, but it's not all of them. So um, there are men who are with other men and they are, the man is the abuser. There are uh, women who are with other women and the, therefore the woman is the abuser. And there are women who are in heterosexual relationships who are, the woman is the abuser in that situation. Um, and so we know it can be any gender. Uh, we know offenders can be any age. We know they can be any race, any ethnicity. Um, so a lot of times when we think about offenders, we think about sort of, quote, bad guys, right? We, that's that's, that's the, the first thing that pops in our head is bad guys. But really, it could be anybody. Um, very often, it's somebody with their own trauma history. 
that is probably the most the biggest commonality between all of these offenders is somebody with their own trauma history. Um, and we talk about that. We talk about offenders experience with ACEs or offenders experience with trauma histories, not to excuse their behavior, but to better understand what, uh, what happened in their lives that are, that is now leading to these poor decisions. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned a part of a, a uh, acronym that I'm familiar with just because of my work in the community, but can you talk about what ACEs mean? Sure, sorry about that. Uh, ACEs is Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, here in Shelby County, over half of our population has had at least one adverse childhood experience. That could be anything from growing up, you had a parent in who was incarcerated. You had a parent who used drugs and alcohol heavily. You witnessed uh, adult fighting in the home. You yourself was a victim of physical violence or sexual violence. Um, and then uh, I think one of the other ones is around witnessing severe mental illness in the home as well. So some really, these are the top uh, uh, life experiences that we have as a kid that lead to, unfortunately can lead to future uh, poor social outcomes. Meaning when you grow up, they impact your life. Okay, thank you so much. And then too, uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was what can those folks do that have uh, survived uh, these sorts of uh, traumatic experiences to make sure that their children who also saw this don't now become the perpetrator? What can they do to break the cycle and break the curse? I think one of the best things people can do is talk about it. I think a lot of times we still today do not talk about the domestic and sexual violence that occurs in our families. And when we're not talking about it, we're keeping the shame um, alive. And, and shame is probably the worst thing that victims can experience and can hold on to. Uh, so once we talk about it, once we admit, yeah, that was, that was really bad. What happened in that situation should not happen again. I mean, even just some base, I'm not saying go deep, uh, you know, with, with kids, do it age appropriately, but certainly admit that, that that wasn't a situation we want to repeat. That's something that shouldn't happen in a family and, and, and within a relationship. Um, so talking about it is a huge thing. Obviously coming to Crime Victims and Rape Crisis Center, talking to a trauma counselor would be super helpful. Just learning about tips for recovery from trauma it is absolutely possible to recover from um, some of the most horrific violence I've ever seen. I've had people come in here and um, after working through their trauma histories, after sort of a lot of it's rebuilding our confidence, I have seen people with uh, just grow leaps and bounds. And there is something called post-traumatic growth, that it is possible to actually grow and, um, and be stronger after a trauma experience. So, so back to your original question, one, talk about it, but two, get help, right? So get the trauma counseling, uh, figure out what victim services you may need. Um, three, don't under underestimate the importance of talking about healthy relationships with your kids. It is not something they teach in school. And yet oftentimes parents don't talk about it either. What does a healthy relationship mean to you? What do good boundaries with your partner mean to you? How do you want to be able to communicate with your partner? How do you split up things like chores and financial responsibilities and all that kind of stuff? Those are things we don't necessarily teach our kids other than by modeling it. And if, we're, if we didn't have the best model, we need to actually start teaching it. Wow. Wow, thank you so much. And Chanel's doing such a great job of capturing all these notes. We're so fortunate to have her do this. Make sure you guys are checking in the chat, getting those great notes. And something else, um, Sandy, that I became aware of as I have increased sort of my involvement with structured mentoring programs, right? So I've always done mentoring, but more from a professional capacity. But as I have looked deeper into what it means to mentor sort of our next generation, one of the things that I have become aware of painfully is that the violence amongst um, these youth relationships or um, in these younger high school or junior high school relationships has escalated or maybe it's just escalated because now I've become aware or these numbers are incredibly high. Can you talk to us a little bit about, about what you're seeing in that respect? 
So we are seeing, oh goodness, so we are in lots of different middle schools and high schools across our community, teaching healthy relationships, teaching things like consent and boundaries. Um, we don't, we don't, we're, we can't talk about sex in schools anymore. So instead we talk about consent with, with like, hey, can I borrow your Wait phone? Wait a minute, I'm sorry. Every show on TV and every song can talk about sex. Did you just say we can't talk about sex in school anymore? No, we're not allowed to talk about sex in public schools. So, <laughs> so instead, you know, we, we, we say things like, hey, can I borrow your, you know, can I, can I see your phone as opposed to just snatching up somebody's phone? Um, we teach consent in lots of different ways, not just sexually, but it really is consent is about that bodily autonomy, making sure that we respect people uh, to their core, right? And so that's one of the things we get out and talk to folks about. Uh, what we see is one, we see it particularly in the younger ages, we see more girls displaying violent behavior. Um, and I wonder if some of that is uh, feeling out of control in other areas of their lives. So they try to exert control through some slow, again, that low level violence, right? Things like just smacking or um, stealing cell phones, uh, pushing, you know, that kind of stuff. We, we're, we're definitely seeing more of that in girls in middle school. And then you start to see more of the violent behavior coming out more in boys when it gets into high school um, ages. But certainly, we see the violence. We also see violence because people are witnessing community violence too. So it's not just what violence in their homes and violence in their communities. And um, unfortunately, there's still a lot of um, stigma or social acceptance of violence. And so when it's accepted and that's what makes you quote unquote a man or makes you tough, unfortunately, those messages are hard to break through. Mm. Okay, so as parents on the home front, before this even becomes a problem, what I heard you say was we need to teach respectful boundaries at home. As young as children are, the snatching, the grabbing, even from you, or there's, it shouldn't be happening with parents, but with parents and with siblings, that behavior, as soon as it is displayed, needs to be addressed and under, and really enforcing boundaries and respect of other people's personal space and their bodies. But then also talking about, you mentioned really having a conversation intentionally about what a healthy relationship looks like with your children as young as they can remember, because you said middle school is where you're really seeing sort of these numbers surge with violence with younger girls with, for whatever reason. But really having those conversations about other ways to express your emotions, like use your words. But really, if you see these things start to uh, manifest, you want to address them and not ignore them. Really do some deeper dives into why this behavior is being displayed. Because you mentioned, Sandy, that it may be as a result of feeling out of control in other areas of their life. So really we want parents and aunts and grandparents, everyone that can get with one accord to have those conversations, particularly because they are necessary. And then number two is if they're not able to have conversations about sex in schools anymore, which is shocking to me if you couldn't tell by the expression on my face, um, don't know why, but since we can do that now, you really want to talk about what that looks like and what consensual sex looks like between two people and it can't be just to satisfy the needs or physical desires of someone else and it can't be out of obligation or position title in a relationship is that right um sandy correct absolutely the other thing okay. that we're working on uh we have a, a series called hope and healing uh, it's we're doing it right now with job Corps, so kids ages 16 to 24 and we're doing things like um, helping people better identify what they're feeling better identify their emotions so the other thing that when you grow up um, in poverty or you grow up without parents at home or you grow up in these you know, experiencing trauma you oftentimes tend to push down your own needs you tend to ignore your own emotions and feelings and when you do that and you get older you don't you you have a harder time identifying what you're actually feeling so you may be feeling hurt but you process that as anger and so you lash out uh, to address the anger when really you're just hurt by something that's happening and so one of the things we're talking to these kids 16 to 24 they're not kids anymore but these young adults 16 to 24 is really 
that's a major part of um, being able to control your behavior is to be able to understand what the root, what's the root emotion, what's the root feeling that's happening, and can I address that in a healthy way before I just lash out in anger and violence. Thank you. And then to Sandy, what should a parent do or a teacher do if they recognize that they see um, some young people or some young person that is in a violent um, relationship? So if, if they feel like anyone is in the violent relationship, either as the aggressor or as the victim, I think it's really important to take them aside in a really safe place, make sure that no one's around, no one can hear, and just say, listen, what I've seen between you and so-and-so, whoever the, the partner is, I'm concerned. Can you talk to me more about uh, your relationship? What's going on in your relationship? Maybe just some open-ended questions to start, and then, express your specific concerns. So I saw them do X, I saw them push you into a locker, for example. Um, to me, that doesn't feel like a, a good thing that your partner should do to you. How do you feel about it, right? And so really just trying to do it using open-ended uh, questions and some education pieces instead of just judgments, not, mm -hmm. You shouldn't let that boy do that, right? Because that's, of course, going to be a, an immediate turnoff of you're telling me one more thing not to do. So instead, try to be as open-ended um, and educational about it as possible, even when we ourselves are upset and we don't want them to, you know, be pushed in a locker or whatever, to try to make sure that we remember that if, if we can let it be the victim's decision every single time, or even the, from the aggressor standpoint, really, it's, it's we need to make sure that they maintain um, respect and dignity throughout the entire situation, even if they're displaying bad behavior. Okay. And if you're a parent and this is happening, whether you're, you notice that your child is, um, is a victim or um, is the offender, what exactly should you do um, in that scenario? Um, I think, again, first opening up the, that conversation, hopefully that will help. Um, sometimes, you know, junior high and high school, we're not so eager to talk to our, our parents. So maybe looping in another supportive adult, somebody that, 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 that your child trusts, right? So it could be a, a, a youth leader at church, or it could be an aunt or an uncle, uh, anybody that that person trusts and see if maybe they might be able to start that conversation and then loop the parent in a little bit later. Um, so uh, one of the things that they talk about with ACEs and resiliency, recovering from adverse childhood experiences and recovering from trauma is that one supportive adult or that one supportive and caring person because connection is so important. And so I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves as parents or educators that maybe we're not that one adult, but let's try to find the one adult that, that is good for our kid. Um, we sometimes can't be the be all end all for, for our kids. Okay. And as a parent, am I able to call the police if, if my if my child is um, the victim of a relate in a violent relationship? Am I able to call the police? Am I able to get them? Um, um, am I able to bring them to your offices for a rape kit or for STI testing? Absolutely. So. All right, so let me, let's break that down a little bit more. So one, absolutely you can report, anyone can report any crime to the police at any time. Um, the non-emergency number might be the best in that situation. Just have somebody come out, patrol officer come out and talk to you um, and talk to your kid, hopefully. Uh, you can also bring your child for an order of protection. And so an order of protection is a civil process, so it's different than the criminal process. Um, and that's something that just says to the offender, hey, there's abuse happening, I want you to stay away. And so that's really what that civil protective order is. You can, um, adult, uh, parents can apply, parents or guardians can apply on behalf of their kids for an order of protection. Um, people need to realize though, under the civil process, that they will be in a hearing with the offender. So that you'll be in a courtroom with the offender to prove that this order is necessary. And so that can be sometimes intimidating for victims. Um, so there's a criminal so process. How, a, prove, how does that work? How does that work? If your child doesn't want to cooperate, but I'm the guardian or the parent, and, and this is a real question. I'm a guardian or a parent, so someone has this question. If your child doesn't want to cooperate, how, how does that work? So now you're dependent on them and their willingness to cooperate in a courtroom sitting across from 
um, their offender or alleged offender? Sure. So I think oftentimes that's when a victim advocate can be really helpful is to have, okay. is to come into my office and sit down, you know, bring, bring your child in as well. Just say, Hey, I just like to go talk to this advocate. I may be wrong about the situation. Let's, let's hear from somebody else who does this day in and day out. And that way you can have the child be able to talk to us. Uh, we will, we will serve victims, um, in this office, victims have the capacity to consent for sexual assault forensic exams, 13 and older, and they have the capacity to um, file for orders of protection 18 and under, or 18 and over, I'm sorry. So between those ages, 13 and 18, um, we oftentimes just ask the parent to come in with the, with the child, talk through the situation, if the parent chooses to leave the room for a while so the advocate can, and the, the child can feel comfortable talking one-on-one, -on -one, we can work that out too. But that may be when a professional might be helpful. Okay, thank you. And then if you get this order of protection and they go to school with the offender, does someone have to change school or does the school have to get involved? Yeah, so what, what'll happen is, and it really sort of depends on what the victim asks for in the order. So because it's a civil order, they can choose what they want and what they don't want. If they want to involve school, yes, you'll take that order to your school administration and the school administration will work out things like class, shifting class schedules, um, walking patterns within the school, that kind of thing, to make sure that both parties are still able to access education, but that we're, we're doing so safely. Wow. Okay. That is so interesting. I think I could probably go on with that, but I think we satisfied those questions um, that revolve around that. But Sandy, as we get ready to bring this to a close, can you tell us what we can do as a community at large uh, to help you in your office and across the nation, basically? What can we do to help drive these numbers down and start moving this needle in the other direction? I think one of the first things that we all need to do as a community is to remember the importance of prevention. So if we can get out ahead of these issues, we can hopefully reduce our total numbers of violent crime in our community over the years. Um, so if you've got somebody who's been exposed to domestic violence as a kid, get them some help. There's lots of free help. The Family Safety Center, um, will help intimate partner violence victims. The exchange, well, what used to be Exchange Club is now Kindred Place, offers free trauma counseling for kids. Uh, my office offers free trauma counseling. There are so many options available to victims and their families. And we wanna make sure that people are accessing those, those services as soon as possible and not waiting until behavior starts to manifest, right? We wanna make sure we're healing people from trauma as soon as possible. So one, getting the help you need. Um, two, talking about these issues, right? One of the things that feeds violence is silence. And, and that's because of shame, right? Victims of violence can feel lots of shame and can tend to isolate and go in and not necessarily talk about what happened to them, not necessarily seek services. And, you know, the bottom line is we have to start talking about it. So many of us have, been ex have experienced some violence in our lives. So many of us um, have been able to recover. So many of us are still in the process of recovering. And so many of us still need that help. And so let's talk about it. Let's get a word out about, about the fact that it is possible to heal from this trauma. It's possible to change our communities in the future. Wow, thank you. And then if you could tell us um, as a community, um, as a society, Sandy, what is one of the biggest mistakes that you're seeing us make um, that are sort of facilitating environments or fostering environments rather um, for abuse and shame for victims? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's big. <laughs> What's one of, I mean, we could talk about gender roles and how we're socialized into gender roles. We could talk about um, patriarchy and how that leads to some <laughs> violence. I mean, there's a lot of deep, deep stuff, but I think it's also, mm -hmm. let's just remind ourselves that, you know, we all deserve to live lives free of violence. That should be a norm. The norm should not be the opposite. 
And yet currently it, the norm is most of us have experienced violence in our lives and that's just not mm -hmm. acceptable anymore. And so if we all say, stand up together and say, that's just not acceptable for me, for my family, for my community, hopefully we can start shifting the narrative. Violence is not the norm and not acceptable for me, my family, and my community. That's a powerful statement. And last but not least, Sandy, if there is someone that is watching this now or will watch it in the future that is actually a victim um, of assault or find themselves in this situation, what do you want to say to them? One, it's not your fault. What happened to you is somebody else's decision to engage in violence against you. And two, there are so many people who are here to help that you're not alone. And really, if that's, if that's all we can say is you are not alone, that's enough to a lot of people because so many people feel so alone in those situations. So you are please not know alone. that we're, yeah, that we're here. Mm -hmm. You are not alone and you are not at fault and you do not need to be ashamed about the violence that is happening against you. We want you to get help. And if you are someone who knows someone that is in this situation, please don't abandon them. Please continue to offer a safe space for them to talk, to support them. And remember, it is their decision. It is their relationship. And all you need to do is be a willing vessel and a listening ear when they are ready to make a different decision and a different choice for safety to improve the quality of their life. So, Sandy, this has been such an impactful, meaningful conversation. I'd like to say thank you so much for spending your afternoon taking a break from the important work that you do to help us have this difficult but necessary conversation. I think you've answered a lot of questions. For those of us who are interested in knowing more about this topic, for those of us that want to know what we can do to help, you have definitely been a light uh, in a dark alley regarding this conversation. Thank you so much and thank you and your team for all of the important work that you all do and that you all continue to do um, for us to help our communities be safer. Um, so for those of you that are joining us, thank you all so much for spending your afternoon with us today. We appreciate your time. Be sure to screenshot all of the resources that Shamil has captured in chat. And if you are not following us, to keep the conversation going, make sure you do so at Total Woman Summit and at Sharika Himes on Instagram and join our inner circle so you can stay in the know about future things coming down the pipeline and how we may also be continuing this conversation. You can do that at TotalWomanSummit.com and sign up for the Summit Inner Circle. And we look forward to seeing you this evening for our second segment on this topic with Marquita Odom. Thank you, Sandy. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.